Hi there, this is Dave and welcome to the Dungeons of Dragon Quest IV Ranked from Worst to Best. Here, we're going to be looking at all the mainline dungeons of the original game and ranking them based upon their fun factor, how inspired the design is, and just the coolness factor. So, with 21 dungeons to get through, let's get the chapters rolling and get started. Number 21, The Cave West of Keeves of Chapter 4. I really do believe that this is the worst dungeon in the entire game, and let me tell you why. Here, the sisters are not only thrown into the largest, most mazy dungeon of the introductory chapters right off the bat, but you're stuck with only a white and black mage. You have no physical fighter until you happen to stumble across Orin deep inside. And you really barely have any time to grind for equipment beforehand, because this is literally the first place you're told to go to outside of your own hometown. Number 20, the Zenith and Tower in Chapter 5. This namesake tower is easily the longest one in the entire game, and as such, it's unfortunately incredibly annoying. The setup of the whole place reminds me of, like, cardboard boxes stacked up on top of each other. It's just a crazy mishmash of multiple doorways, dead ends, stairways going up and down, and winding hallways to nowhere. Then amongst all this, you have to find one single passageway up. Yeah, you're gonna reach Heavenly Zenitha at the top, but damned if you don't have to go through hell to get there. Number 19, The Birdsong Tower of Chapter 2. This is the ultimate Chapter 2 dungeon, where at the top lies the Birdsong Nectar, created by the elves to cure the king of Santim's lost voice. This is undoubtedly one of the hardest dungeons of the introductory chapters, filled to the room with enemies, and while there is an inn located in the basement, that does nothing to help you as you make your ascent. That all being said, though, I do think that it's a nice challenge for your balanced party before Alina goes on to kick ass and take names in the Andorian Tournament. Number 18, Actempto Mine of Chapter 4. The Chapter 4 dungeons are pretty bad, and the mine can be rather difficult. However, this is nothing compared to the one that comes before it. Here you actually have Orin to help you out, and by this time you should have a decent setup of equipment in order to handle the difficult enemies that infest it. The mine is not all that long, and it does a nice job preparing you for the challenges that lie ahead in the final chapter. Number 17, The Cave South of Gardenbur of Chapter 5. Apparently the justice system in Gardenbur is guilty until proven innocent, because you're accused of stealing the bronze amulet by the queen, but then you're tasked with finding the real crook. So not only do you have to go through this horrific mazy cave, but you have to lock up one of your own party members as collateral too. There is some decent treasure in here, but I'm continuously turned around because it's very easy to get lost. And, to top it all off, there's a pretty difficult boss fight at the end, too. Joy. Number 16, The Cave of the Petiqua of Chapter 5. As the southernmost cave on the world map, this dungeon is obviously pretty cold. And as such, ice physics are introduced here with moving tiles as you make your way through the labyrinth to cure poor Cristo. At first, the ice is okay, but by the end of the place, I am over it, as you'll be slip-sliding your way on through multiple times in order to get all the treasures. And then, whenever you reach the bottom floor, it's pretty much just like trial and error to find the route. On a side note, I do enjoy the mini-story of the other band of adventurers out to save the world, but this is the last time that you do see them. I kinda like to think that they all died of hypothermia down there. Number 15. The Iron Safe Cave of Chapter 3. Chapter 3 gives you two optional dungeons, and personally, I do not get the Iron Safe in the NES version of the game, because there it takes up a precious inventory slot, and when you only have eight of those slots, they are at a premium, especially here in Taloon's chapter, where the enemies can drop all sorts of really nice stuff for selling, and all the Iron Safe does is let you die without losing half of your gold. So I hop in there, grab the chain sickle, and head back out so I could be on my way to bigger and better things down in Endor. Number 14, the Cave of the Silver Statuette of Chapter 3. This is the second optional dungeon in this chapter, but I do actually go in this one. Taloon is trying to gather 35,000 gold to open up a shop, and you can get 25,000 of it here by finding the Silver Statuette and then selling it to the antique dealer. But this kind of sucks in Chapter 3 because, number one, Taloon is useless, so you have to hire some helpers. And then secondly, in the NES version, you only have eight item slots, 
and there's tons of treasure to gather down there that you're going to want to sell to make up that 10,000 gold difference. Though those of you in the know will be aware that you can come back here in Chapter 5 to get some free items for the hero. Number 13, the Shrine of Breaking Waves of Chapter 5. This could very well be the first instance of a dungeon where you ride your ship into it. I love that. The shrine is located north of the castle of the king who collects small metals, and you come here in order to acquire the zenith and armor. It's filled to the brim with difficult monsters, but I like it because of the unique layout is just kind of naturally incorporated into the game world, and therefore it is memorable to me. It's a challenge, but in a good way. Number 12, the cave south of Frenner of Chapter 2. This is a rather difficult dungeon for the trio to tackle in Alina's chapter, because it's filled with fire-breathing enemies, but it's also a great spot to gather treasures and power up for what lies ahead. There's even a unique story involved going on here, because back in Frenner, there's an actress impersonating Alina, and of course she gets kidnapped. So to rescue her, you need to trade her for the town's treasure, the golden bracelet, hidden deep inside the cave. Unbeknownst to you though, the bracelet is the key to the secret of evolution, so if it wasn't for this dumb bitch going around being a poser, Necrosaro would have never came to power. Number 11, the World Tree of Chapter 5. The World Tree was introduced in Dragon Warrior 2, and the tradition continued into the third game as well. But in those games, it was just a place to pick up a revival leaf. But here, it's so much more. You get a treasure map right after getting a ship, and it takes you to the majority of Chapter 5 in order to find the X that marks the spot. But once you do, you stumble across the hidden village of the elves at the base of the tree, and then you begin your ascent with a party of three, since you need to rescue Lucia, a fallen Xeniathan, as well as get the Xeniathan sword so you can make your way into the castle. Number 10, the secret playground of chapter one. This is the first real dungeon of the game, and most introductory dungeons are easy jaunts to give you a feel for the mechanics of the game. This place though, not so much. There's a voice that leads you to the flying shoes, so if you want, you could just kind of run over to them with no encounters. However, you're not going to want to do that, because if you go off the beaten path, you're going to get some much needed gold and Healy, and if you don't grab him, you're going to be screwed whenever it comes to the boss of this chapter. Number 9, The Cave of Betrayal of Chapter 5. As the first dungeon of Chapter 5, there's no other cave quite like it. There's no random encounters, and it's more of a story dungeon, as you make your way through here to find the symbol of faith and gain Hector's trust. Early on, though, you're separated from Mera and Nera, and you're forced to find the real sisters amongst the monster imposters. Mechanically, this is pretty much just an excuse to quickly level the hero up, and it's a smart design decision, as well as a fun little challenge. Number 8, Actempto Mine Revisited, in Chapter 5. This place can be a wall, or a fun challenge, depending on how you look at it. After going through the original part, you stumble across Esturk's underground palace. Thankfully, though, there is a healing point before you enter. But the difficulty spike combined with the boss fight can bring even a veteran RPG player to their knees. As a kid, I remember coming in here scared to death of what awaited me at the bottom. But this is a rite of passage in order to get to the endgame portions. Number 7, the final cave of Chapter 5. The not-so-final cave brings you down to the underworld from Godside, and while the final caves in Dragon Warrior 2 and 3 are pretty much just complete bullshit with their repeating floors and pitfalls, they learn their lessons here. It is incredibly long, but it's actually kind of cool with a nice sprawling underground lake surrounded by poisonous swamps and puzzle mechanics. This is the cave to Roan and the cave to the Necrogrond, but done right. Number 6, Lock Tower of Chapter 1. As Ragnar's ultimate dungeon, this one's pretty cool. I mean, lots of RPGs have towers, but how many of them are surrounded by a moat that you have to fly to, and then you have to traverse the tower from the top down? It kind of reminds me of the Poseidon adventure, as you make your way down to the basement, encountering more soldiers, kidnapped children, and the awesome Sword of Malice. Then, as an added bonus, there's even a healing spot right before the boss. Number 5, The Great Lighthouse of Chapter 5. This is your first real challenge of the final chapter, mostly because that useless bastard Taloon can't do anything right, so of course he runs away and he makes you climb the lighthouse to stop the evil fire. 
added little touches like the mini demon knocking himself out as he tries to exit the tower just adds to the charm and ambiance of the place. And the first boss fight of Chapter 5 awaits you at the top as well, putting your tactics to the test. Thankfully, the reward is worth it as you get a ship and the world then becomes your oyster. Number 4, Necrosaurus Palace of Chapter 5. This is exactly what a final dungeon should be. It's atmospheric, it's imposing, it uses a unique tile set, and it's large, but not too large. Some final dungeons can be too long for their own good and they just drag on forever, but not here. Prior to this, you do have four mini dungeons to break down the barriers and gain access, but once you're in, it's relatively straightforward. You grab the Sage of Stone, you use the Baron's Horn, and then kick Necrosara's ass. Number 3, Cascade Cave of Chapter 5. Side quests really weren't a thing back on the NES. They were really only introduced on the third game with the whole Kandar arc, but here we have one of the only side quests in the game. First, you have to go to the optional Seaside Village for the Stone of Drought, then, once inside, you'll get the Sand Glass of Regression. But the true treasure of the cave is the all-powerful Metal Babel Sword, which your warriors and white mages can all use. It's great for grinding metals and just slaughtering monsters in general. Number 2, The Colossus of Chapter 5. For an NES game, this is such a cool concept! The Colossus separates the civilized human world from the monster's realm, and in order to get to Dire Palace, you have to climb the giant, activate it, and then cross the river. It really showcases the divide between the two civilizations and just how remotely all the monsters live. You can come here anytime after getting the ship, but good luck surviving first thing. This is definitely an endgame destination. And finally, number one, the Royal Crypt. Of chapter 5. I love the Royal Crypt. This endgame dungeon is just slightly south of Endor and it's fantastic. Although it's only three basements, there's a lot here. The sliding tiles pretty much just deposit you straight to the bottom floor where there's millions of metal babbles ripe for the killing. It's the perfect grinding spot because not only do you have access to the metals, but there's also a healing point so you can just grind to your heart's content. And then, they even put a teleporter down here too, so you can just warp right back up to the top whenever you're done. The designers were really looking out for the players here. Well, that's it for all the dungeons of Dragon Quest IV Ranked. If you like this video and wanted to hear on the channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon for exclusive videos and early access to my content, checking out some streams on Twitch, or coming on over to my Discord to chat and hang out. The links to them can be found in the video description. This has been David. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good day.